Hey folks, here we are with Ben from MP Antenna, the makers of H Antenna, to clear up a couple of RF um, confusion points in the world of helium. So Ben, start off by saying welcome. Thanks for coming on. No, thanks for having me yet again. These are fun. Uh, the more questions we get in, the more we kind of figure out to try and help people understand more, the better we all off are. So yeah, let's start off with one of the confusing points of, of just kind of this this POC V11 and V10 and, and what the switch was and what's actually happening is when a, and we'll just talk about US miners. I know that America isn't the only country in the world, but this just makes the math easy. Let's say that the US miners are pushing out 27 dBm, decibel milliwatts. And then you put a an antenna on there that has a higher gain. So that increases your EIRP, your incidence of, what is it? Effective incidence radiate whatever, whatever it is, the strength of the mm -hmm. signal going out, we'll keep it pretty clean. Um, and then that gets received by another hotspot and they translate that into, or there's an RSSI that gets received at, a received signal strength indicator gets received at, and that hotspot, if it has a hotter antenna, can receive at, at a higher sensitivity. Does that all sound right so far? Yeah, no, it sounds pretty accurate. And a lot of things, a lot of uh, things that I've seen going around Discord, Reddit, and all the other platforms is that uh, this is it's meant to hurt or damage people that are trying to earn more um, you know everybody wants to have more witnesses everybody wants to earn more HNT and thinks that this was deliberate to uh, disable people from earning more and uh, what a lot of what people don't know is anything that's unlicensed like in the ISM band that we're using with helium that also incorporates 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz uh, like in your Wi-Fi routers or anything unlicensed and they're all subject to the same rules um, the easiest way to look at this and understand that is way, let's say back in, I'll just throw it out there, like 2002, a lot of your Wi-Fi routers, you could disable, or not disable, um, you could change out your Wi-Fi antennas for more optimized antennas, which are higher gain, which would reach further, so on and so forth. Almost every single Wi-Fi router you see in the market today, you can't take off the antennas. And they've learned to make that more, um, a way to make them legal for the FCC is they don't allow you to change the antennas anymore. So it's um it's, it isn't subject just to helium. It's it's across the board. It's across the world. Um, don't take it personally. Um, it's just something that we have to adhere to. Yep. And then there was a a point of confusion that you had that we were just discussing. Let's let's get into that. Tell me what you saw was the confusion, and maybe we'll walk through that together. Um, the confusion of being what's what makes the transmission power get reduced if it does get reduced. Uh, a lot of people are saying you can you cannot go above a certain DBI antenna, which is true, but also not true. There's a lot of murky areas in RF and with this whole EIRP thing and POC love it. Um, let's say to keep it simple, let's say you just had a nine DBI antenna, which is a higher gain antenna, um, and you were two miles away from whatever is witnessing you. Um, when that RSSI is heard, it's not so much that it's being reduced reduced off of the RSSI if it's too hot or too good. It's whatever you're you're actually putting into the app that is, is negating the power, lowering the power. So if you have if you have a 9 VBI antenna and your RSSI is going to be, let's say, a, a neg 68, when they know it's supposed to be around a neg 75, they're gonna reduce the power to your miner. At least that's, I'm pretty sure that's how it's working. Okay, no, I, I think I can clear that part up. So mm -hmm. up, like as long as it's within the legal limit of in the US uh, 36, Mm -hmm. Helium won't reduce the power. I actually made this mistake on another YouTube video. I said they would reduce it. They don't reduce it. They just take it into account. So it goes into the RSSI equation kind of accounting, right? And they say, mm -hmm. oh, this guy's got a nine DBI and this guy's got a three DBI. This is kind of how these two things will see each other. This is the expected RSSI. It won't reduce either of those because both a gain of nine and a gain of three still keep you under the US legal limit of 36. Okay. But if you put on, let's say a 15 DBI gain antenna, now helium will, when you put that in your app, right? So helium can't detect what you're pushing out. So they're relying on, on us to accurately report what we have. Um, when you say, hey, I've got a 15 dBi antenna on my hotspot, helium will say, okay, all of your transmissions will be reduced by six to get you down to the legal limit. So it's not on mm -hmm. like a per transmission basis. It's when you update the, uh, the antenna information in the app, then the basically the app sends to your hotspot, hey, reduce your transmission strength by X to get down to legal limits. And I guess this is another question I just thought of, what happens if you don't update your app? 
If you don't what? If you don't update the app. So let's if say you don't you update had... the app, you'd be pushing out at a higher level. I mean, this is kind of good. It gets into stuff that is is at the same time complicated and and simple. So it depends on how deep you want to dive into it. Mm -hmm. um, and and this is a great place to do it. So when I think about this, like where is the use case for for asserting a different um, gain than you actually have? And it's pretty clear, like we're. A, we're all trying to build a network. No one's trying to game. This video is being recorded on uh, January 12th when there's a giant kind of gaming fiasco going on around Helium. Mm -hmm. We're going to set aside the gaming stuff right now and just kind of focus on the realities of, of RF and radio wave propagation. So a reasonable time to say, let's say you've got a nine DBI antenna. Um, it might be reasonable if you're putting it inside your attic. So it's inside, inside an attic. You know that that signal will get attenuated or weakened because it has to pass through the attic. And you also know that any signal coming into you also has to pass through the walls of your attic. You might, you'd have to take a guess here and really you'd have to test it. Um, but you'd have to test and say, okay, the attic it attenuates my signal at, for example, one DBI. So I'm going to assert a gain of eight because I know that outside of the attic, that's what the, the gain will appear to be. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? That no, makes perfect sense. Um, and, and there is... And I guess that's a good uh, segue into um, something I, something that I've talked to a lot of people about of, well, is a high gain antenna bad? No, it's not bad. It's there for a reason. Um, all these higher gain antennas are there. They, they were invented. They were they were made for a purpose. Same thing with, and we can dive into the whole uh, inline amplifier thing too. There's a reason that those are on the market. Um, and it's not just to, you know, boost the highest power possible because technically that's illegal. Um but it's a these all these things are made for a purpose and they are utilized in the real world outside. Not that the helium is not the real world, but in right. other real world use cases yep. um, that have been around for a very long time. Yeah. So I mean, the, the the layer that we've got on helium is that all of this is is heavily driven by earnings, and so people are optimizing for earnings. They're not necessarily optimizing for RF coverage. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I've noticed is that. I think we've talked about this in other conversations is that even low gain antennas, even the H antenna, which is a three DBI antenna, that mm -hmm. thing will, will connect with a witness and, and receive beacons from over 200 kilometers away over water, to be fair, over the Pacific ocean. You know, it's, it's at um, just South of downtown San Diego and it'll, it'll hit stuff up in Santa Barbara occasionally and definitely up in North LA. Mm -hmm. So I guess a confusion point I have is, is why would someone use a high gain antenna if you're not really getting any extra, let's say, legitimate range? Like it's already going 200K. How much more range do you need? Well, and see, that's that's where it comes into kind of the hobbyist of, and let's let's backtrack or not, let's go back in time. It's a better way to put it, of about mm -hmm. a year ago, when at that time, the more witnesses you had, the better you were, or right. you wanted to, I mean, even today, it still, it still uh, makes sense to, if you want to get to a better transfer scale, a better area, and be witnessed by, better miners or better hotspots in a better area. Um, that's one way to think of it, but also the, you know, the high gain antennas, you don't necessarily need them. Um, and with helium, especially, you don't know if you don't need them until you test things. Um, when you have consecutive people, like, I mean, I remember way back when we first all got together and you put up one of our antennas and you were using like, a, I don't even know, uh, probably a 90 DBI or something. And then you're hitting LA and it was, mm -hmm. how is this possible? And it's because of the protocol that they use. Um, even as of this morning, a friend of mine in Colorado, <laughs> he's crossing state lines. He's up in Evergreen. He's hitting Laramie, Wyoming. I mean, that's 143 kilometers away with an indoor antenna right on his window. Now, is that an everyday use case? Is that going to happen for everybody? No. But it's it's pretty remarkable that a very low gain antenna with, you know, no no afterthought of here, I'm going to put it in the window and that's it. And it goes that far. It, it's, it says something that you don't always have to have. Uh, you, you want the antenna outside, you want it to have elevation, um, but you don't necessarily need a high gain antenna. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think on, on top of that, well, I guess then the, the question becomes for me, if I'm thinking about this kind of practically is if it's not a range question, when you're going between a low gain and a high gain, is it basically you get the same practical range? Let's say it's 200 kilometers or less. Like a high gain mm -hmm. is not going to get you to go 600 kilometers just because of whatever curvature of the earth. Mm -hmm. So if, if 200 km over water, let's say 150 km over land is your, your practical max, um, 
I don't see a reason to use a high gain antenna unless you have you have kind of known attenuators in the way. That's the only time I see a reasonable reason. But for the rest of the time, if you're getting out your antenna outdoors and up high and there's nothing blocking, the pattern of a low gain antenna is it just provides more coverage. Correct. It does. It really, really does. Um, and even to go, I guess, a little bit deeper into that, uh, I've had a lot of um, customers write in and say, well, I, I switched antennas and it's flatlined. I switched antennas and nothing is happening. It's not working. And trust me, I'm, I'm a victim of it too. Of you, Everybody wants things to work immediately. And after an hour, after a day, nobody wants to wait. Totally get it. Uh, yep. But more times than not, even if you switch it without even uh, rebooting your miner or turning off your miner, um, it may take a day to maybe seven days to accumulate more witnesses and actually see what, you, what it's actually doing. Um, there's not really a, a good other real world example of swapping something and saying, well, I didn't get the same results, but there are two different things. So it's, um, it, it goes back to, you know, patience is truly a virtue in this endeavor. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And, and having testing tools. I think that's part of it is, is knowing that um, a helium hotspot is not a testing tool, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's, excuse me, Jesus. It's what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not like a glamos where you immediately say, okay, I hit the button and I know that these packets went to these places because I'm immediately seeing that back. I'm not waiting on peer-to-peer mm -hmm. -peer stuff to update and none of that stuff. So yeah, if you want to actually test it and get good results and have good signal to noise, you need to use testing equipment. A helium hotspot is not testing equipment. Right, right. Um, okay, cool. So I, I think that covers the confusion we had with the high gain and the low gain and when the power gets reduced and when it's just taken into account, which are two different things. You'd said something I want to clean up a little bit um, mm -hmm. is it's due to the protocol that these signals can go so far. When you say it's protocol, what, what do you mean by that? So by LoRaWAN, um, that, you know, long phi slash LoRaWAN, it, it's the same thing. Um, essentially it's the same thing. And it, it's just, it, I've said this multiple times before, it's meant to go the distance and it, and it can travel um, very, very, very far, even obstructed. Um, yep. So, and I guess even to touch on before, uh, we were talking about high gain antennas. There, there's nothing wrong with them, um, even right. if you're using one right now. Again, there's 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 very little you can absolutely do wrong and don't do, or <laughs> you know someone's going to come after you. It's going to break your miner. Um, yep. It's just trying to help people to answer questions as to you know what, what should you try, especially newcomers to everything. What should you try? What shouldn't you try? What what have other people tried that um, is a fool's errand? Um, that's you know try and learn from others instead of recreating the wheel that doesn't work. Yeah. Well, let's with that, let's talk about uh, amps and splitters and multiple antennas. Yes, so, a lot yeah. of people are excited about it. They always have been excited about those. And in theory, those are all awesome things. And they do do what they say they do. But they're not really good for what we want to do with helium. Um, cool. I guess we can start with the splitters first. Yeah. Um, you know, with, with the splitters, uh, on, in theory, on a, on a whiteboard, you're going to get uh, the common scenario is using a high gain directional Yagi or sector antenna to get everything far away. And then you're going to be using a lower gain Omni to get everything close by. In theory, okay. it makes sense, checks out. But in reality, what you're doing is it, because the concentrators, the lower gain concentrators are only a size of radio, it means single input, single output. You're only meant to have one antenna. Um, multiple input, multiple output is minor antennas. That's when you see multiple antennas. And some people actually have gone online and seen, uh, you know, lower wing gateways have two antennas for antenna diversity. It's not necessarily MIMO, but there is two antennas to get better reception, better transmit and receive. But that's not, it's, yes, it's lower wing, but it's a different gateway device. So we'll, we'll stick to the single input, single output of what we're dealing with with helium. Um, and when you take a single transmission line and split that, you have no, there are some more expensive splitters out there that you can define Okay, on the left path, it'll go 0.5 watts. On the right path, it'll go 0.5 watts. Typically, with the less expensive splitters, it's just throwing power out there, and you have no idea how much power out is actually going to each antenna. And oh, so it's not a 50-50 guaranteed split? No, it's not. Um, it's it's more of a, a better way to think about it if you have, uh, like, on, on the spigot on the side of your house, and you have a Y splitter. So you, get, you can have two spigots now. You, are you, you going to have an even distribution of water in each spigot and when you're splitting it? It'll it should be, be, but it might not be. Okay. It'll be close, but it's you have no guarantee of what that's what that's going to happen or how that's going to happen. Yep. Um, okay. Same thing with the receive. So both transmit and receive, you have no idea the power is coming in or going out. Um, and, a, and a better way to think of it too, if you have a higher gain, if you're splitting it, just not even high gain or low gain omni or directional, um, 
you're only you're only transmitting out at one watt or 20 was 36 dBm. Um, so it's yeah, only 36 one watt max. Out. Yep. Yep. Um, so if you effectively think of that, you're splitting at 0.5 and 0.5 if it was evenly distributed. So you're having your power out automatically if it was evenly distributed. So you're kind of hurting yourself in a way, um, not even knowing it. Yeah. So let's talk about the two or maybe three scenarios. The first scenario is when you talked about you've got a high gain and a low gain antenna. So let's say a nine and a three. And a nine, your intent is to reach far and the the low gain is to, to, to cover the near distance. Now, one problem I see with that, just with my third grade math, is that one of those is three, one of those is nine. What do you report to the app? Mm -hmm. um, because they, you're still, you know, as far as from the, the app's perspective or the hotspot's perspective, you still only have one antenna. Like it can't tell that you have two antennas on there. No. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a, a, a reasonable way to do that. There are definitely ways to do that. And if you're a geek, you can, you probably don't need to watch this video, but I think what I'm aiming for with this is like, hey, you're fairly new to helium. You're certainly new to RF. Like here's the basic concepts of how it works. And the first thing is that a splitter splits things maybe unevenly. So there's that problem. And the second thing is that if you've got these two different gains, there's no way to accurately report that. And both of those reported um, gains, if you split the difference, will be wrong. If you don't split the difference and you report three, it'll be way off on the nine and vice versa. Yep, absolutely. So, Cool. Anything else to add to kind of scenario one there, like a high gain and a low gain? Um, the only other thing that a lot of people don't um, think about is that they, so having a having this scenario of a splitter or a high gain directional antenna and a low gain omnidirectional antenna, um, a, a very common way to do this, if, if you would think of an intersection and you have cameras in an intersection, and mm -hmm. let's say a municipality wants to uh, look at these cameras in this intersection, you'd want to have connectivity from, let's say, all four sides of the intersection. So you'd have an omni antenna to connect to those, but you also need a backhaul, which would utilize the high gain antenna, but you have two different radios doing those two separate things. They're mm -hmm. bridged together on the backplane via ethernet usually. Um, but so the reason you do that is if they were all on the same frequency and on the same channel, you're providing massive self-interference. Um, so that that backhaul is going to be, it's going to be obstructed by self -interfer by RF self-interference. And with healing. Okay, you got you got a lot of jargon there. Let me let me break that down. <laughs> Hang on a second, Ben. Okay, so the, I I think the point here is that let's say a packet comes in from a, a an antenna far away, and it's received by both your high gain and your low gain. Mm -hmm. If that packet comes in from both antennas and goes into the miner, the miner has a tough time saying like, "What what am I doing here?" Is that kind of the the big picture, or is there something else I'm missing? Uh, it would be more of so when you when you have a hotspot and it transmits between 902 and 928 megahertz, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's several different channels on the lower end that it transmits and receives on, but it's in that yep. block of 900 megahertz. Um, if you have one one hotspot that's has two antennas, but you're operating on the same frequency, but one but one is the low gain on me, so you're creating a big bubble around you transmitting on the same frequency. You're trying to transmit out on the high gain. You're creating self interference at the same point. So you're oh, okay. You're, so this is more for like a beacon, not so much for a witness. More for uh, transmit, I mean, not so much for receive. Or is it both? Yeah, yeah. I would say more for transmit than receive, but it could be okay. seen as both ways. Um, you're still obstructing yourself. Um, and then you could you could even go more into it of saying, well, you could use uh, bandpass filters. But when you're filtering yourself, what are you actually filtering? It's kind of you're you're in a a, a snowball of your what, what's in what's causing your problems is the splitter and using multiple antennas and just get rid of that. And there's no more problem anymore. Right. Okay. I think that, that's pretty reasonable to say that is probably not a great strategy. Um, no, it's, and it does it, going back to, will it work? Yes, it'll work. It's not going to be the best scenario for you. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But I think if, if you've got the ability to put the Omni up high, like that's where you should focus your efforts. Okay. Yep. So scenario number two is, is actually more reasonable to me and I just don't do it. I don't recommend it just because it's overly complicated, but there may be other reasons to not do it. And that's that you have one hotspot. You got two antennas that are both directional antennas and they're pointing on different sides of a building. Um, maybe you have mm -hmm. four and they're on the four sides of the building, but for right now, let's say one's pointing North, one's pointing South. They're the same gain. They're both, let's say nine, um, 9 dBi sector antenna, so they're they're providing that coverage. I guess you could put 18 dBi as your gain in the app, and both would be 
they still would they still get clipped because helium's not going to push out over nine anyway. Um, mm-hmm. What what are the downsides of of doing kind of this north south or east west or whatever like two sector antennas pointing different directions? Uh, the first thing that comes to thought is what we first talked about of uneven distribution of power. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you could also have reflection of power back into your miner. Um, talking more about um, SWR or VISWAR. So you don't know, again, you don't know what power is going out where. Um, so you could have a reflection of that power coming back into your hotspot, which over time will destroy the concentrator or the radio card. How much of a risk is that? If we're pushing out, let's say we say that we got two nine, nine DVI sectors. Mm-hmm. And so we, we put in nine in the app. I mean, how much of a risk is there that one of those, I just don't see that that is a problem. Maybe I'm missing something. That one of those gets the full nine, which it would get anyway. Yeah, what it's... It's not a it's not a plug in and everything blows up. It, it'll be something that happens over time. So again, it's not a it, is it going to work? Yes, it'll work. Um, but over time, you're not doing good things to the hardware that you invested a lot of money in. Um, right. For I mean, sure, you could possibly get short term earnings for that. Um, there are much more lucrative. Well, let's say a year ago. Um, but for now, it's it's not. In my opinion, it's not worth the risk of taking of throwing things into the transmission line that are going to do more harm than good. Yeah, I'm 100% on board with you. I'm just trying to walk through the logic on it. So right. I guess it wouldn't matter if you had two nine DBI gain antennas, because that's the max you can push out anyway. But if you had two, like, I don't know, six sector mm-hmm. antennas, and you wanted them to get max power, so you you mark your, your gain at nine, there's a possibility that, that those antennas could get more power than they quote, should get. And that's when it gets reflected back. Or am I not understanding like how stuff gets reflected back or how the system works? It would just it wouldn't be what you actually assert in the app. It would be it would just it would honestly just happen. Um, it's something you can't control. Mm. So it, it's it's when you when you throw things in the transmission line and you actually don't know what's happening, you can't can you literally can't control what what is going to actually if it's absorbed back into your concentrator or radio card or if it's actually going out. You you honestly don't know. You could measure it. Um, it's probably going to take a while to actually figure out what data you're actually collecting is accurate. Um, but it's it, it's not going to destroy the hotspot. If you plug it up and it's been working for two months, it's not going to destroy it in another two months. It'll happen probably in six months or something like that. It's not going to be okay. immediate. Again, plug and play and things fry and everything goes to crap. Right. Okay. So you could, you could do this um, and not know right away that you're damaging your hotspot, but over time, mm-hmm. let's say a year or two years, you're going to fry the hotspot is pretty likely with the splitter. Now I, I'm guessing because I know that splitters are used in, in the kind of greater radio world outside helium. Is it just that you use a nicer splitter or is there some other method of people that people use to, to stop this reflection and, and kind of destroying power? Um, you could use, well, there's, just like anything that a lot of people have discovered, you can you can go and spend you know twenty dollars on an antenna off Alibaba or Amazon, or you can spend three hundred dollars on an antenna. I um, mean, and you get what you pay for. And a lot of some of these splitters, you can actually go and actually define again, like the left half will have 0.3 watts, the right will have 0.7, things like that, and those cost several hundred dollars. Um, does do people want to pay that? I mean, if it's for a hobby for doing this, I personally haven't done it, but you can absolutely okay. do that. But, okay, uh, so you could spend more money and 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 you would eliminate that risk, but you're spending more money and and it, I mean essentially you're just complicating things unnecessarily. But don't need to be complicated. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's splitters. What about uh, amplifiers? Because there's there's at least one use case where it's okay, but for probably ninety eight percent of people, it's it's not. Walk me through what happens there. So back in the day, back in the before times. Um, when you could have 200 witnesses and you'd earn off of all of those witnesses and you want to reach as far as possible. Totally understandable. This is before POC 11, all that good stuff. When it truly was kind of a wild west of we could transmit however hot we wanted to. Um, that's, there's no, there's nothing wrong with that other than you're technically doing illegal things. Um, if you're, if you only have, let's say 10 foot of coax and you have a two watt inline amplifier and you have a nine dBi antenna. Um, what are you really trying to achieve other than getting the furthest reach possible, which is completely understandable. But, you know, with now, if you, if you're capped at 18 witnesses that you can actually earn off of, and I believe that's correct, right? That you're so, capped yeah. at 18. Um, let's just say 18. Um, and you have, you, you already have 18 close by to you and you're getting an extra 10 by adding this amplifier. There's no really need to, there's no need to do that. Um, 
there's not a need. Um, if you were the you know, one use case that I fully support of, of people wanting to put these on towels, and that's what amplifiers are used for traditionally. Um, if you have a run of, for, for maintenance purposes, let's say you wanted to keep your hotspot at ground level, which makes sense because if something happens, you have to get a power crew to climb up and, and take a look at the splitter that burned out or wh whatever the problem may be, or just yep. simply rebooting it. You're gonna put a one watt, two watt amplifier on that to make that 200, 300 foot run of coax make sense. Um, that's really what they're used for. And they're used by cell companies, they're used by two-way video companies. Um, they're very, very common and that's what they're, that's what they're there for, um, is, is to traverse long lengths of coax. If you have those long lengths of coax. Um, when you're saying simply, coax, that's antenna cable for us, like non-technical people. Yes. So, yeah. so the uh, when people go on and say they get the LMR cable, the LMR 400, 600, uh, things like that, or 200, um, that, that those are the that, that's the coax or cabling that I'm talking about. Yep. Okay. Cool. And then, what are the hazards of using an amplifier? Can it can it reflect energy back the same way that the splitter can, kind of, and burn your hotspot out, or is that not really a thing? Yes, no, that's a thing. Um, so we'll go back to the example of the 10 foot run of coax or LMR. Um, it's a bi-directional amplifier, meaning it, it tr amplifies out and amplifies in. So if you are, let's say you've got a two watt amplifier and you're transmitting out, you already have one watt at the transmitter. You have, you do have some loss in the coax or the LMR, but you're adding on two more watts to that transmission line. Yep. It's a lot, it's for helium, that's a lot more power. Yep. Um, same thing with the receive signal. Once it hits that amplifier, it's receiving back, adding two watts directly back into your radio. And that's, so that's the danger new. side, right? Yes. Now, will that, let's, will, if you want to blow it up instantly, go get a 10 watt, go get a 15 watt, <laughs> just put more power in there and it's just not going to last. Make long. the magic smoke come out. Yeah. It, it's, uh, but using a one watt, two watt, is it going to happen the first time you use it? Is it going to happen the first week? Most likely not. But over okay. time, it's going to, it's going to degrade the sensitivity to your radio card and slowly but surely it's just going to keep dying and dying until it doesn't work anymore. And then you'll be scratching your head. Why did I do that? Yep. Okay. Is there a, like a, a calculation that you might use? Cause I, I know people and I, I never got into using amplifiers or splitters, but I can see the, the attraction is like, Oh my God, more powerful mm -hmm. is better. I want to get across this distance, whatever. Is there a calculation they might reasonably use to say, okay, it's time to use an amplifier or it's not? Um, to seriously look into it, um, let me answer this as simply as I can. Um, if you are in the realm of using, let's make the cap of 30 foot runs of coax or LMR. Mm -hmm. If you're going over that and you truly cannot use the POE method of getting your, your, uh, minor outdoors, and you you have to use a 30 plus foot run of coax. It might be worth looking into using an amplifier. Um, All right. Now, in in doing that, you're going to have to. In a lot of these online calculators, um, you you have your transmission power out, which is usually set at one watt because that's what everything unlicensed is regulated to operate at. You'd yep. have to you have to put in your correct wattage out, which would be. If you have one watt plus a one watt amplifier, that's two watts, or translate that into DBM off the top of my head, I don't know what it is. But, um, or whatever power amplifier you have, yep. and then it'll say how long of a run of LMR 400 or 600, and it'll calculate what your EIRP out will be. And as long as that um, is within what is within the realm of what is legal, then you're okay. So it's not a, it, it will take some playing around with to see what you actually need, which, a lot of these deployments, if, if you're going on a cell phone tower, if you're going on a hand tower um, in, your, in your parents' backyard or, or wherever, it's not going to be as cut and dry of you buy this antenna, 30 foot run of coax, this miner, and you're good. That's it. Um, there's so, going to be more homework to it. Yeah, definitely caveats because coax is not just coax. Like 400 is different than 600 or 800 mm -hmm. or 240 or 195. So mm -hmm. I don't know that I'd push out or I'd, I'd push it on that idea that like just 30 feet is the minimum because if you have 30 feet of LMR 900, you don't need a, an amplifier. Correct. Right. So most yeah. people are thinking when they think LMR, they just put 400 behind it. Cause we're also new to radio that it's like, that's the only cable that we think exists, but it's not, there are thicker, lower loss cables. Mm -hmm. I'd say is, is a yeah blanket statement is that a hundred feet or less, you're just better off either getting a thicker cable or you know, like an LMR 900 or, or something that's lower loss rather than putting an amplifier in there. Um, I'd agree with that. 
yeah, the, the cost might be a little bit more for the cable, but you're just eliminating a ton of complexity and potential problems. As you start to go over 100 feet, that's when you, I think it's it's reasonable to start thinking about an amplifier, mm -hmm. um, depending on how you, how, how you, yeah, what you're doing. And then the other thing I would think is just a very rough rule of thumb is you want to get the 27 dBm that your hotspot is putting out. You want to get that amount of power to the antenna is how I would think of that. Mm -hmm. So if you're using lower loss cable and you've got a three dBi antenna, um, let's see how would I, that's, that's the way I think to explain this. Yeah, you just, yeah are, are, you, are you gearing toward uh, using a higher gain antenna with a longer run of coax? I mean, I or... think that's, that's reasonable. Like, like here's the thing with antennas is anywhere between three and 5.8, doesn't seem to make a huge difference to earnings from the experience I've had, right? Mm -hmm. You can use a three, you can use a whatever, a four, there's a 5.8, there's even a six. Like it doesn't seem in most cases that switching one out for the other makes a giant difference. Now there's always an edge case and I'm sure, sure someone watching this will be like, well, my antenna, you know, I jumped mm -hmm. earning six X. Like, that's cool. There's 430,000 hotspots in the network. I've seen a lot of them uh, might be different for yours, but for most of them, not a huge difference between those. One way to think about having an antenna up super high is you can kind of offset that loss by having a higher gain antenna, but you just change the pattern of that antenna's radiation. And so you can have less local coverage. Yeah. Um, for these tower things, like, man, if you're doing tower climbing stuff, you're probably not watching this video. This is probably not the thing for you. Mm -hmm. In most cases, I try and keep your runs under 50 feet, use LMR 400, and don't worry about how much loss you have. You're going to have a great range anyway. Yeah, it's when people get into the nitty gritty of it, it's it's honestly nitpicking of, well, I'm I'm gaining 0.2 more dB in power, and that's what I want to do. And and that there, again, there's nothing wrong with that if you want to do that. But you're back to your point of is there much difference between a 3 dBi and let's say a mid gain up to 6 dBi antenna? I, I've had customers say that the 5.8s have done one HNT a month better. I I can't predict that. It's it's every single deployment's different. That's that's the hard part about all this. Um, it's the fun part, but also the annoying part is everybody has their own little their own their own little world of how they're deploying and how to make the best of what they can do of, yep. of how they're using it. Totes, totes. Okay, so that's splitters, that's amps. Uh, my general recommendation is don't use that stuff, don't mess with it, unless you just like geeky stuff. In that case, mm -hmm. have at it, but know that there are some some risks. Um, we talked about multiple antennas with splitters. I know that there's like a multiple antenna gaming issue that we are, we're not going to cover here. Um, cover that in other videos. And then the last thing to talk about is the bandpass filter idea. Um, I do get occasional questions about that. And to, to kind of paint that picture is that a bandpass filter is a, a filter you put basically, you know, connected to your antenna and hotspot that filters out some of the signals around you. And you would typically use that if you're putting your antenna on a cell site where there are tons of other antennas that are blasting out either enormous amounts of power that are close to your frequency or, or far away or whatever. Like you're trying to clear out some of the, the noise from the signal. Is that, that's correct with the band pass? Yep. That's absolutely correct. Um, and even if you can figure out, like, let's say you're on a rooftop in a major city and there's, I don't know, 30 different antenna systems up there and you have no idea what they are. And let's say you don't, you don't have access to the equipment to actually sniff out what is actually being transmitted what is it cell? Is it paging systems? Is it SCADA? Is it, is it other helium? And you really don't know. Yep. Um, if, if you don't know and you don't want to buy this stuff or find a friend or whatever to do it, put a bandpass filter. It's not going to hurt you by any means. Oh, um, really? Okay. It's, it's not going to hurt anything because all it is is limiting um, adjacent, adjacent interference that's going to be over in from 902 to 928. So if it bleeds over, it's making your hotspot only be concerned with what you're actually looking at transmitting so to be here. what's the cost of a bandpass filter like what what would be a reasonable amount of money to spend on something well let me google it <laughs> i don't know stand by let me ask gooks yeah I'm, I'm wondering if it's something that's reasonable for for the average person to do if it's kind of 50 bucks if it's more like hey if you if you want to get a good one you're going to spend 600 like i, I don't know I, have, I haven't used those things i've got a couple clients who have and they've played around with it i think i don't know if you and i were batting this white paper back and forth where they had said that you're far better off getting kind of six feet of vertical standoff 
from mm -hmm. other antennas than using a bandpass filter, but you could use both without. Yeah, it's, it's kind of you filter. can you can duly attack it for better lack of terms yep. and, and get that uh, uh, standoff for better lack of terms um, by yep. six foot and also using a bandpass filter. And even by just quickly Googling it, I've got some that are $200. I've got some that are $600. Uh, I've got some that are $700. Now, does everybody want to spend that kind of money? I highly doubt it because I wouldn't. And even with the filters, if it, let's say you've had your hotspot running for a month and it sucked, I may, and you have a lot of other uh, antennas and things around you and maybe worth looking into to try, um, you don't have to spend all the money. You don't have to spend $700 on a bandcast filter. You know, you can, like this Elcom one, what is this? How much do you cost? Uh, it doesn't list the price, but let's just say it's, it's 200 bucks. You're probably going to spend in the realm of 100 to 200 dollars on a bandpass filter. I, I think. Don't quote me on that, because sure. I'm sure people have found them cheaper. Um, but again, it's it's not going to hurt anything to use one. Right. Okay. Well, it won't take any power away. It won't won't affect the. It's going to be minimal loss. Um, it's not going to be like you're losing 2 dB, um, something like that. Right, and that would be called insertion loss. Right, is like when mm -hmm. you start putting things in line that is lost from lightning arresters or bandpass filters or whatever. Right. Typically it would be more, it'd probably be more beneficial instead of having a bandpass filter. And I would say 80% of uh, deployments than having um, actually having a lightning arrestor versus a bandpass filter. Sorry. So if you're going to, if you're going to put insertion loss for something, having a lightning arrestor versus a bandpass filter would be better off because you should have a lightning arrestor on almost anything that's deployed outside. Okay. All right, that's a nice little PSA. Is you should uh, you should put a lightning restaurant. on. You really should. <laughs> yeah, and it, it seems to make a yeah, yeah. I, I get that question a lot. And you've for your lightning rest or work, you got to ground the thing. You can't just put it on there and and it looks pretty. And you know that that little tab is hanging off. I've got one right here. You know, if if this guy isn't connected to your ground, then this guy can't do its job. Correct. And electricity does like to hurt things. <laughs> yeah. It likes to blow up electronical things. <laughs> Magic. Okay. Uh, is there anything else? So we did uh, splitters, amplifiers, band, path fil band pass filters. Is there any kind of the kind of geeky stuff that you're seeing? I mean, you guys are an antenna manufacturer. H Antenna mm -hmm. is uh, out of Ohio. Um, so it's American made antenna. Super good stuff. I use it on all mine. You guys must get a boatload of calls about RF geekery stuff. Is there anything else that you guys see? Because you field most of the phone calls, right? That's a commonly asked question. I would say um, 100% of them, if you give us a call, I'll pick up the phone if I, if I can. If yeah. not, I promise I'll call you back. But um, a lot of it is uh, entry-level stuff, which, again, there's no question is a stupid question, especially if you don't know. RF, uh, wireless stuff, networking, nobody learns it overnight. Um, it's right. It can be very complicated. If you feel dumb about what, what kind of connector type is this, don't feel stupid. Because um, I was there at one time, and I <laughs> I didn't know... I didn't know the difference between an N-type connector and an SMA connector. I had no idea. So right. it's uh, don't feel stupid with questions. Um, the good thing about this community, for the most part, is everybody's here to help each other. Um, the people with knowledge like to expel the knowledge. Um, and we want to help. So, Cool. Is there anything, is there a question that you answer like five times a day? Uh, what, connector, what connector type do I need? Um, and more times than not with an antenna, not just our antenna, but like the Elcoms or the or the Racks or the McGills, they usually have an N female type uh, connector. Mm -hmm. So your <clears throat> your cabling that you're going to need to get for an outdoor antenna is going to have to have an N male. And mm -hmm. I would I would and correct me if I'm wrong. I would say 97% of the hotspots out there have an RPSMA female connector. So your other end of your cabling to connect to your miner is going to have to be RP, RPSMA male. Yep. And I've got a I've got a connector. I think it's called What Connector is the link on my site. Mm -hmm. But even after having put up a ton of these, I will still pull that thing up on my screen and like point at it, and be like, "That's what I need, and this is what I have." And I'll be looking at my hotspot. Like, sure, you feel kind of dumb, but if you you get it wrong a couple times trying to not feel dumb, and then you're just like, you know what? I'm just going to do this paint by numbers, step by step, and get the right thing because I've got at least four cables in my garage that I ordered the wrong thing when I was starting. So. And I guess the, the other question, too, that we get a lot of, and I don't have a problem helping with, but uh, it's, here's my hotspot, here's my location, what do I do? And uh, for, I mean, for the most part, it, there is some work that goes into deploying these things, and we don't have all the answers because we're not there with you. 
So right. it's, it is a case by case scenario. And I mean, even like what we did way back when, when all this started of what, what gain intended do we use? Um, is it a 3 DBI? Is it a 9 DBI? Is it a 23 DBI, uh, uh, sector antenna? But we did a lot of trial and error and a lot of testing. And it's not, I'm not calling people lazy. Uh, it's just, uh, you, you've got to test and you've got to figure out what's best in your scenario. Um, yeah. we, we can point you in the right direction, but there, there's no guarantee that if, you know, my, my 3 DBI antenna works fantastic for me in my attic and you're in an attic in LA, is it going to be the same? It's, it's not. Um, and, there, and no. there's no way to see what would be, what would be the best other than trial and error. Yep. Yeah. You got to test the stuff for sure. I was, mm-hmm. I remember I was surprised when I came out there and we're looking at just the local topography and the trees and everything. I was like, Oh wow, you guys have a really different RF environment than yes. Southern California where it's, we just don't really have the trees, the, the same kind of organic cover that you have. Mm-hmm. So cool. Dig it, Ben. Thanks a ton for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, if you guys like this conversation, you want to support uh, what Ben's doing and help people out. It's hntena.com, hntena.com. Yep. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's cruise over there and uh, pick up an antenna. That's uh, that's that's what I use on pretty much all my deployments right now. I think I've got one or two that I still have to switch out, but they're great antennas. Uh, they're not perfect. They're not a panacea. They're not sort of. They're not like a perfect cure, um, but they're a great start. And I think it's to me, it was one of those things where I said, "Hey, I just don't want to worry whether or not I've got a good antenna. I'm not super motivated by getting the cheapest deal. For me, I'm way more like I just want a high quality antenna." Are there places where a higher gain antenna will work better? Of course, right? The world isn't mm-hmm. the same all over the place. But if you just want to get an antenna up there and you want a good one, I think they're a, a great, great provider. Uh, yeah. Anything else before we wrap up? We good? We're good. Everybody have fun and, and call if you have questions. I'll be here. All right. Right on. Thanks, dog. All right. Thanks.